All right. All right. I think we're good. Let me see. Let me do it. Let me do a sound check over here. I think everybody is muted. Everybody's muted over here. Thank you so much. Good evening, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. Thank everyone for for joining us tonight as we uh, continue our walk through the book of Job. Thank you, Reverend Stanley, for, for, the, for, for the devotion. Thank you, Sister uh, Mary Foster, Sister Val Hardiman, for our administrative work. And thank you, uh, Mother Vaughn, for our hostess with the mostest. We're grateful for um, getting together again tonight as we prepare our hearts and minds for our Sunday worship. I pray that the Word of God would again speak to us tonight in such a way uh, that we're clear. Uh, I had to talk to Deacon Lyons that we were, I was at church for a few minutes and we had a chance to talk. And I, I told him that this, this Joel book is real. And, and I don't want us to be fearful about Joel, but I want us to be aware of Joel's prophecy and understand that Joel's prophecy was, in fact, to Judah, um, the southern kingdom, but also it speaks to the, the, the people of God today. One thing, and I said this earlier in the week, when the, when the word of God speaks, it, 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 it's not like a, uh, how do I want to say this? It's not like a, uh, a little small uh, horn. It's a trumpet. It it, it, it resounds through time. Let me put blast. Like this, huh? A blast. It's a blast. Thank you, Reverend. It's a blast. It's a blast <laughs> throughout time into eternity. Quite frankly, and 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 understanding that we cannot um, close our ears, or close our hearts, or close our minds to any word that's spoken in the Word of God, whether it be the Book of Genesis or the Book of Revelation. It blasts throughout time into eternity. So that being the case, as we read what's happening today and what we read what uh, Joel is prophesying to the people of Judah, let us take and, and put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the people of Judah. Let us know this as surely as God spoke through Joel to Jonah. I'm sorry, through, through Joel to Judah. He is speaking through Joel to us today. And let us not be afraid, but let us be resolved. That's the key. Unfortunately, see, the, the concept of fear uh, has two two manifestations. One is to run, and the other is to reverence. And we want to we want to reverence God as a result of His Word. But what we don't want to do is shut down, close up, and act like it's not going to happen. Which is what Judah did. Judah heard the word of the Lord. It wasn't just Joel. It was Habakkuk. It was uh, it was all the prophets. It was uh, Hosea. They all prophesied, and the people of uh, Israel of Judah rather kept saying that ain't for us. That ain't me. I don't know what you're talking about because everything's lovely. One of the fantastic things about passion is. Uh, watching and praying and being interceding and, and recognizing it. Unfortunately, some folks think they got it made. And here's the reality. None of us have it made. We all stand in need of prayer. We all stand in need of repentance. We all stand in need of constant um, uh, exercise in, in drawing close to the Lord. There's none of us that got it right. Can I say that again? None of us is just sitting pretty. Um, we all stand in need of more and more uh, effort into our, in, into our relationship with God so that we may experience the fullness of God in our lives. Judah didn't want to do it. And so uh, God finally, over time, um, sent prophet after prophet, and now finally Joel is prophesying. And one thing we're going to see, we've seen, and we'll see in the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. Here's what, here's what Joel was saying. Listen, uh, your behavior has brought about the necessity for judgment. The judgment of the day of the Lord, as he called it, is on the way. That was his message. And his only request in chapter 1, and we're going to see again in chapter 2, and ultimately in chapter 3, that the, that the request was that everyone would respond to God in such a way. Now, let me pause and do one more thing today before we get to our text. Here's the truth. Somebody might say, well, we can't do nothing about the world. Well, that's not true. But the most important thing is we can do what we can do for the Lord. And the second thing is, as we come to Christ, as we call out to God, as we declare the goodness of the Lord, then the world can be changed. We cannot say, well, that's on them, or uh, whatever God's going to do is going to happen anyway, because that's not true. That throughout the word of God, there were always people who were remnant, who God kept and protected. And the Lord showed me this day when I saw these lines. If y'all remember in the book of 1 Kings, when there was uh, a drought in the land because of the, uh, the arrogance of Ahab, and the, and the land was put into a drought, and Elijah uh, stood before the um, prophets, I'm sorry, stood before the prophets of Baal, and, and he prophesied, and as he prophesied, uh, he told there wasn't going to be no rain. And during that season when there was no rain, there was no rain in that season, what we later find out is that during that time, God sent, um, he sent Elijah on a sabbatical, and not just a sabbatical, like a vacation, but a time where he could have an encounter with God, and then so he could and receive his instruction with God. What God did was he sent him to a city, a city uh, in the midst of of the, the the people who are the hardest hearted, the people that, that followed Ahab, they were they were some out of worship folk. But there was a woman there, 
that God sent uh, Elijah to. And that woman and her son were preparing to die. She was preparing to eat one more cake and die. But God sent Elijah there, and she responded to the prophet, the man of God, the word of God, and as a result, she received overflow. Now, I say that to say this. as lo- What God requires from us individually is a turn to him and a trusting in him and believing in him. Pause. And when we do that, God's power, which permeates and supersedes all the world, is uh, is not just available to us, but it's expressed to us. Just like uh, in Ephesians said, it's now to him that they keep us from so all wise God be power, mass, and million. And it says toward us. In other words, God, God's power that worketh in us, it comes from him through us, in us, to bless us. And so let us keep that in mind uh, as we try to determine whether or not we should follow God. We should follow God at all costs for our personal restoration, for our personal um, um, being kept by God in person so that we can pr- pr- prosper in God no matter what's going on around us. I believe some of us could say this, that we could argue that during the last four years, no, no matter how hostile the environment, no matter how a short-sighted government was, that God blessed us and sustained us and then kept us and even prospered us during that season. I want to think about that. We've complained about stuff, but what we realize, what we should realize is that during this season, because we trusted God, God, God prospered us. Matter of fact, let's just go back to March. For those who have been on this line and for those who have been affiliated with the word of God in some capacity, what we'll see is that God has kept us. He sustained us. He's kept us healthy. He's strengthened us. He's prospered us in many ways. And so for, the point I'm making as I go through our text tonight is to let us de- deliberately decide to trust and follow God and watch what God will do. At the same time, let us follow God and cry out to God on behalf of this nation so that God can save, heal, and restore this nation to be a nation that is not him just because it's printed, not that doesn't just trust him because it's printed on the money, but we trust him with our heart. That's what I want us to understand. In the chap- chapter 2 of Joel, what we see tonight is this. Uh, at chapter 1, um, we saw that there was a prophecy of destruction that would come by uh, the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, and the uh, caterpillar. And, and But we also see that God it, it was, cry- was telling the people to cry out to him. Then he came back to the destruction that would t- take place. Now, uh, Joel is moving to a more specific thing, and I'm going to read this in segments tonight. So we're going to read it in two segments. I'm going to read all of it, and I'm going to, if you would allow me to summarize it, I'm going to read the rest of it, and we're going to put it together. So here's what it says in chapter 2, and I'm going to read several verses. Blow ye the trumpet, listen, in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all of the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord coming, for it is nigh at hand. So I'm going to pause right here. Here's what God is telling Joel. And his responsibility is, and really to all prophets, he says, blow the trumpet. The trumpet was always blown in Zion, in Jerusalem, uh, for the purpose of uh, for notifying the people that danger was imminent. If there was, you know, enemy armies coming, the trumpet would be blown so the people could take the proper posture and position for fighting battle. They may be in the bed, but guess what? When the trumpet would blow, um, they would be they would they would they would rally themselves together to prepare for the incoming enemy. Here's the truth, and I read a lot of military techno thrillers. Today, as well, out of all the nations of the world, Israel has one of the most, the foremost responses to potential enemy attacks. They're always ready for enemy to attack them. Why? Because they realize they're surrounded by enemies. But I must tell us, we're surrounded by spiritual enemies here in this country. We may not be, Canada may not be trying to invade us, or Mexico might not be trying to invade us, or Puerto Rico, or well, not Puerto Rico, or Jamaica, or Haiti. But guess what? We're surrounded um, by spiritual enemies. Why? Why you say that, Pastor Thomas? Well, the prince of the earth, Satan himself, goes to and fro him who he may devour, and he's seeking to attack and devour God's people. So we are constantly under enemy attack and under enemy watch, and we need to be responsive to the clarion call of the trumpet. What's the clarion call of the trumpet? Is there no noise? No. It's the word of God. Below you the trumpet is I am. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the world land tremble. Let them be shaken out of their slumber. Into, an, uh, into a spiritual awareness of what's taking place. Sound, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, is, is, is Joel declaring what the word of God says, what thus says the Lord. Can I pause parenthetically and bring us to 2020? That's the role of the pastor, preacher, teacher, everybody who has a responsibility to declare the word of God. All of us who are children of God have a responsibility to sound the trumpet, to blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. All of us. It's not just Pastor Thomas. It's not just Pastor Half, the Pastor Jack, Pastor Harris. It's every preacher, every deacon, every Christian has a responsibility to declare 
thus says the Lord. Now, in order for us to be able to declare it, now we got to know what it is. And so this is what is happening here today. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound alarm in my holy mountain, that all that happens to the Lord tremble. Why? For the day of the Lord cometh for his nigh at hand. The judgment of the Lord is coming, is nigh at hand. In other words, he's saying the judgment of the Lord is not way off in the distant future. It's coming. It's almost here. The trumpet is being sounded because trouble is on the horizon. Now, I've got to pause again, parenthetically and pastoral, and say this. Here's the problem where we face today. We, as a nation and as a body of believers, have determined to put our faith and dependence and trust on people. That's our issue. Our out of worship is not um, 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 Malek or, or other gods of other nations. Our our idolatry is people, power, and money. We think that if we got the right person, we good. If we think we got the right position, we good. If we think if there's enough money, we got it. And God is telling us that's not where we're supposed to be. Yeah, the world is doing that, but God didn't call us to do that. And so as a result of this reality, we must understand that, that God is calling us to move out of our slumber and trusting and depending on others and instead depend on God himself. That's what God is calling us to do. Um, here's what happens next. Now, hold on to that point. Now, here's the description of that day. I'm, I'm doing two parts. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. They have not been ever the like, neither shall it be any more after even to the years of many generations. Okay, I know I told you I was going to break it down to several parts, but let me can I, let me do the verse two first. Let me do verse two. Here's here's the picture. Think about at seven nineteen when the sun is supposed to be coming up. You go to your window, and instead of seeing a rising sun and light, you see a rising darkness. That's the picture that Joel is painting. And this picture of this rising darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I'm not talking about because even when it's cloudy outside, when the sun comes up, it goes from gray to light gray. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about it's going from dark to darker. That's what he's talking about. And so that being the case, he's saying that this picture, as the morning rises and this darkness spreads, and it spreads upon the mountain, a great people and a strong that have not been ever like it. There's going to be enemies. Now, in chapter one, the enemies were the locals. Now, in chapter two, the enemies are actual armies that are lined up against Israel. So picture this. Israel, in chapter 1, was, it was prophesied they did not turn to God. They would be destroyed by all of these insects that would come and totally devour the land. Now, think about that's That's bad enough. But now the armies are going to come fight them. And they are ill-prepared to, re, to, to repel the armies. Why? Because they are totally weak uh, in, in terms of... Of land, they don't have no, they can't they can't even close up the gates of of, of 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 Israel. I'm sorry, they can't even close up the gates of Jerusalem and hide out. Why? So they don't have no supplies. All the food is gone. Their situation is, is is not just bad; it's awful. It's terrible. It's tragic. And so that's the picture that Joel is painting on this day of judgment. Verse three: A fire divides before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is at the garden of Eden before, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, nothing shall escape them. The, the army is coming. Now, you've already had the destruction, but God is telling Joel, tell him that even after destruction, the land will look like a paradise now in comparison to what's going to happen when the army comes through. How about that? God says it looked like a paradise now, but it's going good because even as bad as it is going like to look like a paradise now in comparison to what it will be when these armies come racing through. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as a horseman. So shall they run. God says it's going to look bad. It's going to sound bad. It's going to be bad. Verse 5, the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that divides the stubble as the strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. I was talking to a guy who fought in the military, um, and he was saying that sometimes the worst moments in battle were before the battle started because they could hear um, the, the enemy um, planes dropping bombs, and he said the the sound of the enemy planes frightened them. It scared them. And I said, "Well, tell, what do you mean?" He says, "Well, when they would be landing in the in the in the I guess whatever they love, uh, what do you call those holes? Um, not cubby holes. What do you call them? Standing when they would hide um, in the little thing, the trenches they would cut. It's going to come back to them. But they would hear the whee, they would hear the sound of the of oh, the mortar rounds. They would hear the sound of the bomb." Bunker, in a bunker. Thank you, Representative. We tagged on that one. Bunker. They would hide in the bunker, and then here comes all of the bombs coming down. But they would hear it first, and they would look into each other's faces, and you could see the fear on their faces because what they knew was about to happen. That's what God is saying is going to happen to their judgment. That on that day, 
that the people will be afraid because of the sound of the incoming armies. So they won't just be surprised. It'll be a moment of a, a, a moment of clarity before the enemy comes. Finally, he says, they shall run like mighty men. Who? The enemy. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his own ways. They shall break. They shall not break their ranks. In other words, their attack will be coordinated. And it'll be consistent. It'll be constant. The people of God, of people of Israel, I'm sorry, the people of Judah will stand no chance. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his own path. And they shall fall upon the sword. They shall not be wounded. God says the enemy will be invincible. I love this part in verse 8, chapter, the first part of chapter 8. Neither shall one thrust another. Why did God tell Joel that? Because Israel had seen time and time again how God could cause enemies to fight against one another. We recognize that. We remember when God told David to go up there and fight the Philistines, and, and he told them um, when the wind would blow in the bushes that they were to get in position. When they got in position, God let Israel watch them fight one another, destroy each other. God said, not this time. Not this time. There's no remedy for what's going to happen militarily or politically. They shall walk everyone his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. God said, even when they fall upon the sword, they ain't going to die. They're going to be all right because the enemy is going to be just that uh, invincible. And I want to be clear. This is not an enemy that is outside of God's started. This is the enemy that God has allowed to do this because of the disobedience of God's people. Verse 9. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter into the windows like a thief. God said, they're going to be unstoppable. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw from their shining. And the Lord, look at verse 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army. The voice camp is very great, for he is strong to execute his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Who can stand this day of judgment? Who, um, because he's talking to Judah, because of their behavior. And their disobedience to God can can stand confidently in the day of the Lord. And here's the question today. Who can stand in the day of the Lord, the day of just judgment, saying we did all we could? That's the question that God is at, telling Joel to ask us. Now, that is the, the day of the judgment. That is what God has told Joel to prophesy to Judah. And that is what we're looking at today if the people of God don't do what is outlined in the second segment of this chapter. God is telling us that's what's going to happen. Yeah, it may look good. It may look good. Now you're celebrating. Got your new little present. But God said, you got to trust me. God said, oh, we celebrate. You got your soul in the house. God said, you got to trust me. Oh, we celebrate. The economy's going to get better. God said, you got to trust me. Oh, we celebrate because they got a vaccine for COVID. God says, no, you got to trust me. Ooh, can I pause for a minute? Can I pass for a second? Here's the truth. All right. God has protected so many of us from so many different things. I thought about this the other day. I, I, I am super susceptible, susceptible to things, but God has kept me. And it wasn't because I was good, because he's good. And because of that, all of us that look at ourselves and have any level of health and strength, guess what? Why is it? Because of God's protection. And so I'm not saying don't take the vaccine. Don't get me wrong. What I am saying is this. Let's trust God first and foremost in everything we do. Uh, Y'all with me on that? You with me, Nick? That's what God is telling us to do, to trust him. Not to put our trust in Pfizer or, or, or government or people or money or jobs. God can put my trust in him. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go finish this tonight because I, I could get stuck right there. Verse 12. Here's what um, Joel is saying. Therefore, he says, as a result of what I just said, as a result of what God has told me to tell y'all that's about to happen, he, he, Joel is basically saying um, that at the end of the day, here's the only way out of the coming day of judgment. Therefore, also now, says the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart. I got to start there. God said, the first, if you, God said, judgment comes. The only way that it's not going to impact you is if you turn your, turn to me with all your heart. Let me stop there. I, every time I can think of that it says turn to the Lord, it always says with all your heart. It never says turn to the Lord with 25% of your heart. Nope, doesn't say that. It says, doesn't say turn to God with 50% of your heart or 75%. You know, that's it. That was Ted Pentagram said that. He said not 7, 30, not 60, 40, but 50, 50. God don't want 50, 50. God wants 100% of our heart. How about that right there? That's what God wants. Turn to me with all your heart. And and so if you, here's the picture. God says, give me your heart first. Now, then he says, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Three things, fasting, weeping, and mourning. In other words, to fully turn to God, you know, you can turn your mind to God. God, but God is saying, I want your heart, I want your soul, I want all of you, and that's what the fasting is for. God is saying, what keeps you 
Oh, so when Isaiah was little, um, he was diagnosed with ADHD just like I was when I was little. And I remember going to cl- see him in class one day, and he was in the front of the room. And so I said, I didn't really like to sit in the front of the room. He said, well, it's the best way for me to focus on what the teacher's saying. And so what he did was he knew if he sat back, he would be distracted by everything around him. He voluntarily sat forward. Why? Because he could keep focus on the teacher and not be distracted by all things around him. What moves our minds, what changes our minds, what causes our mind to be distracted is other things, fasting. I mean, this, that's why fasting is there. Fasting is us giving up and laying aside those things which so easily distract us. And so God is saying, turn your heart to me, but get your mind on me too by fasting. Lay aside everything that you covered, everything that's important. You've got to lay that aside by fasting. It's not just about food. It's about food, but it's about a whole total Saying, God, here's the things that I, if your thing is riding around the car, that God said, get, put, put the keys up for a minute and focus on me. Fasting, weeping, that's the heart thing too. Weeping, that you are truly sincere about the sorrow that you feel about having disobeyed God and with mourning. Those work together, weeping and mourning. That it's not just, see, sometimes we can be sad because we got caught. Or sometimes we can be sad because trouble came our way. But God is saying, that ain't what I need. God said, I need you to be sad because of the trouble that you, that, because not of the trouble you feel, but the trouble you cause. How about that? When you got kids, you know, sometimes kids, you spank a kid, they crying because it hurt, but they ain't really sad about what happened. What we want to, uh, our children do is to be sad because they did it. God is saying, I want you to be sad because you did it, not sad because of the outcome of what you did. And that's what weeping and mourning means. And that, that requires a search. Um, if you hit Google, you can you can search a lot of stuff. God said, well, you don't need Google to search. God said, all you need to do is call on me and ask, Lord, reveal to me. This is what they did. Lord, reveal to me what I've done and what I've not done so that then I may be truly aware of what I need to do in order that I may weep and mourn, not because of what's happened to me, but because of what I did to you. God is saying that's the first step, those three things. Fast, um, turn to God with your heart, fasting, weeping, and mourning. Those are four things God is saying has to happen for us to find ourselves not subject to the day of judgment. Can we go a little further? What time is it? I'm going to get it. Okay, it's going to be tough. I'm going for it, though. Um, y'all might have to give me three extra minutes, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Verse 13, rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious. Let me stop here. Rend your heart and not your garments. Let me stop there. In, in Old Testament times, as well as even in New Testament times, People would tear their clothes symbolically to represent their internal sorrow. But what Joel is talking about is the fact that people would often tear up stuff that they didn't want. Or here's the better one, that they would sometimes tear up old raggedy stuff on the edges and say they tear their garments, but there was never any real brokenness of heart. God is saying this right here. You need to not worry about the clothes. That's symbolic. God said, I want your heart. I want your heart to be broken. I want your heart to be torn as a result of the of your repentance, that you recognize that you have turned from me and that you want to turn back to me. That's what God is saying that he wants from us, that he wants a torn heart. Uh, we used to talk about this all the time in Sunday school when Deacon Donald was teaching. I know Deacon Thomas and I talked about this and other deacons. What God wants is broken hearts. He don't want us to be sad. He wants to have broken hearts. He wants us to be humble before him because that's what God will. God is not going to mess around with you if you think you got it going on or you think you got it figured out or you're puffed up. God is not that he can't. He just won't. But when our hearts are broken before the Lord and we have a branded heart, guess what? God can not only hear the heart, but he can strengthen us in our relationship with him. That's what God said. I want, I want branded hearts and not your garments. He says again, turn to the Lord, your God. Why, Joel? God, Joel, so let me go ahead and tell you. For he is gracious. He is merciful. He is slow to anger. And he has a great kindness and repented him of evil. I think I'm going to have to stop here because this is going to take me a couple of minutes. So we're going to pick up after that. Here's why Joel tells us that we should turn back to God. First of all, that he is gracious. Now, here's the picture. Some people, even today, say, well, you know what? I done done too much. Ain't no sense of me turning back to God because he ain't going to forgive me nowhere. Joel says, ah, that's wrong. Why, Joel? Because God is gracious. That means he alone is willing to extend his unmerited favor to us. He is merciful. That means he has love for us and he has kindness for us. And in his love and kindness, God holds back his right now. We're about to get to that too. So he's saying, don't feel like, see, if we were going to folk and we had done folk wrong, yeah, I could see us being nervous because 
Folk, my, you know, you, y'all know folk hold a grudge. Y'all know folk hold a grudge now. Somebody know what I'm talking about. God ain't like that. God is righteous and he is just. And so his actions are not based upon him being angry about, about us. It's about being angry about what we've done. And so that being the case, God is waiting in gracious grace and mercy to do what? To accept us back to him if we turn to him. The next thing he said is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. Now, folk, people, people somehow, you know, I don't know if folk got a quick, quick temper. Y'all, everybody knows if I got a quick temper. Got a quick temper. They want you to say something. They ready for something to happen. God is saying, uh-uh. God, Joel said, no, God is not like that. He is slow to anger. It's true. All of us, if we took time to look at our lives and realize what God could have done, but didn't do. We know he's gracious. We know he's merciful. We know he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger, and he has a great kindness. He ain't just kind. God has great kindness. God's heart, Lord have mercy, is full of kindness and love toward us. And because of that, if we come back to him, let's go back to the top of the verse, turn into ring your heart and turn to the Lord. And finally, it says, repent of him of the evil. In other words, God will, will, will not do what he intends to do, not because we manipulated him, but because of his kindness toward us and his mercy and his, kind, and his grace. He will change. He will pull back the punishment. I remember one time that there was a case I was working out in court, and um, and the guy they had a seven day trial. And the guy was found guilty of of having. I think what he did was he 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 got a man in the car, gave a man a ride, rode him to the ATM machine. Then when the man was getting the money, he knocked him down. After he got the money, ran him over twice, and the guy you know got run over. He he was okay, and but he came to court, and so. The guy who got run over was like, you know what, I'm, I don't want him to press charges. But the judge was com- was firmly convicted to do, to prosecute this man to put in the law. And finally, after the, the, he was found guilty, uh, they went up to get ready for his sentencing. And the guy got on his bench and he cried so hard and he was so repentant. And he, you know, he didn't make an excuse about I was on drugs, or I was, I didn't have no money, or I grew up in a hall. He just said nothing. He said I was wrong. He said I was a a man that thought I could get over on folks. I was arrogant. I was full of myself, and I was prideful, and I just wanted to have more, 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 more. This guy didn't do nothing to deserve what I what I what happened to him. And judge whatever you want to do. That's what you do. And the judge was moved to the point where he he was prepared. He said, "I was prepared to give you life in jail." He said, "But I'm going to give you a sentence, but it ain't what you could have had." And the guy walked away and served his little time and went on to do what was right. My point is this. That judge had some mercy, but God got all mercy. Oh, that oh. judge had a little grace, but God got all grace. That oh. judge had a little kindness, but God got all kindness. And God, here's what Joel was saying. God would not only pull back part of our punishment, he'll take the punishment away from us if, if we come to him in the, with, with a broken heart, with a rendered heart, if we come to him and turn with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and turn and, and turn to him with our whole heart and seek the Lord and turn into the Lord our God. I'm going to stop here tonight, but here's what I want us to understand. There's nothing but gain, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church family and friends, in calling and crying out to God, repenting for our what we've done and repenting on behalf of the, our nation, land, church. There's nothing but gain. There's no loss. There's no. There's nothing that will arrange us and cause us to be sorry, sorry, sad, but instead, it puts us in a position or a place where we get to experience the full joy of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to join the Lord. And if God is asking me to come to him and turn my heart to him, that's what I'm going to do daily. Somebody says, I, my, heart is, my heart is on the Lord. God said, keep turning. Keep, keep focusing on the Lord. Well, I know God is gracious. Keep going to him. Keep, keep rending your heart. Keep coming to God with a broken heart and watch God fill us and use us for his greater glory. And as we do that, as we do that on behalf of this nation, as, as we get our minds on God, and, and somebody says, well, you can't really change the nation. I say you can. I say if we stand up for the Lord and cry out to God, God can change us. And if God can change us, he can change our neighbors. If he can change our neighbors, he can change folks down the street, up the street, around the corner, other church. And as we do that, the sound that we will hear is not the sound of incoming, impending danger or doom, but it's the sound of a people of God crying out to God. And in that, we will be saved and delivered. Our nation will be saved and delivered, and we will get to experience the glory of God. But more importantly, we will get to glorify God in our lives. I'm calling time out now. I'm calling time out tonight because I went over. Um, Reverend Stanley, you, I, whoever's on tomorrow, make sure y'all remind me. I did. I owe y'all five minutes. I might have to break it down in the four, in five nights or one night, one minute per night. But um, but we're going to get it back to you. But I thank God for you. I pray that these messages out of Joel 
are, are causing us to, to refocus ourselves on God so that we can experience the full revival that God has for us. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you tonight for the grace and the mercy that you constantly show us in Jesus Christ. I pray, God, tonight as we go to bed, we'll go to bed with joy in our hearts and clarity of mind and thought and a closer desire to walk with you and to repent, call upon your name, to have rendered hearts so that we may experience your fullness. Lord, help us not to be like Judah and just say, well, it ain't us, it's them, or, or we ain't worried about it, it's going to be all right. Help us to know that the only way it's going to be all right is we come to you in the fullness of our repentance and the fullness of our turning our hearts to you. I pray, God, tonight that for every believer that is on this phone, every household that's represented, and every family that's represented. And, God, I pray tonight that your word would get in our hearts, our ears, our feet, our, 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 our minds, and on our tongues, lips, vocal cords, and lungs, so we can cry out to you, that you may hear us, that we may be strengthened in you, and we may avoid your punishment, not just as people, but as a nation, so that we can feel your fullness and really glory in you, and glory in the fact that we have a relationship with you in Jesus Christ. Prepare our hearts and minds down low for tomorrow that we can have a great worship, uh, even virtually, by your power. We love you, God. We love you and we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you and lift you up, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Amen. Hold on, Zoomers. God bless your phone line. Let me shout out to everybody on the Zoom. Let's go to the line. Thank you, Amen. Amen.